you. I do not want to be disturbed. I know, you don't want to be disturbed, except if it's Mr. Shadow, and it's Mr. Shadow on the line. Ah, hello, Zorg, and hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the entire personality of the best hair. And while I do love me some harsh luck, sometimes it's a good idea every once in a while to come up for some air. So let's take a short break from all that and take a look at the classic from 1997, or from 1975, depending on how you look at it, The Fifth Element. Written and directed by Luke Besson, The Fifth Element is a mix of science fiction and mysticism with an old-school style of fantastical technology presented in as dirty and mundane a way as you can. Possibly both because the movie came out in the late 90s, and the fact that Luke began writing this back when he was still in high school at like 16 years old, which could explain a few of the, uh, themes. As the basic synopsis is that an ancient evil threatens all existence. Don't you worry, good aliens exist. However, bad aliens exist, and bad people. But still, the universe might have a chance if we combine Earth, fire, wind, water, and the most important element of all, the fifth element. And oh, well, when I say it like that, it doesn't really sound all that impressive. But let's take a look at the fifth element and see just what you can do with that concept. The story opens up in Egypt, 1914. Professor Piccoli, played by John Bluthall, is studying ancient hieroglyphs with the assistance of his assistants, such as Billy, played by Luke Perry. The hieroglyphs just so happen to lay out the plot for the movie. Ultimate evil comes to cause destruction. Every 5,000 years. So I've got some time then. Oh, that all depends on exactly when the last scheduled visit was. However, the priest, played by John Bennett, witnesses Piccoli read out that the ultimate weapon against evil relies on combining the four elements of water, fire, air, and earth, along with some mystical fifth element. Realizing that the outsiders know too much, he poisons their water which is the perfect way to showcase the more comedic elements of this movie, as Piccoli is far too excited at this discovery to drink. Frustrated, the priest then declares a toast. You can't drink a toast with water. Ah, it would have been so much easier had he just tried to convince them to climb into the wood chipper. And arguably just as comedic. Billy goes to retrieve some wine. Right around the time everyone figures out that they're in a science fiction movie as an enormous spaceship has descended. One absolutely packed with alien life forms. Mondo Shiwan. They've been working with the priest and the priest's ancestors, but unfortunately there's this war coming. And they figure they gotta haul the stones out of there. So, one finger key later, and the wall opens up. God damn, if looks good, kill. The chamber contains the perfect life form, the fifth element. Oh yeah, and the stones representing the elements. So the Matashiwan scoop them all up and head out of there. In 300 years, when evil returns, so shall we. Okay, good. Uh, you're gonna remember to set an alarm for that, right? I mean, you, you really don't want to oversleep on that appointment. Slight problem, though. Seeing a bunch of aliens come down and kill the shit out of his boss has left Billy more than a little shaken, pulling out an anachronistic 1930s Mauser and firing wildly, setting off the convenient auto-closing stonewall security system, and oh darn it, that Mata Shiwan spacesuit is a bit too bulky to run in, so they give the priest a hand. He and his followers must carry the knowledge forward for 300 years, and when the time comes, save the world! That's way too long for a movie, though, so we suddenly jump ahead 300 years. Or 349, but who's counting? The important thing is that a mysterious dark force has appeared in space. Scans are all over the place, and soon it takes the form of a black planet. The space marines are on top of this, though, signaling back to President Lindbergh, played by Tom Liston Jr., saying there's something really weird in space. So, what you're saying is you don't know what this is. Not yet, sir. All we know is it just keeps getting bigger. In space, pure evil returns in multiples of thousands of years. I'm just gonna throw this out there and guess it's Dark Falls. 
General Stadart, played by John Neville, figures just shoot the fucking thing and worry about what it is later. But wait! Ian Holm is here, and he's playing the current priest of the elements, Vito Cornelius. He tells the president that what they're dealing with is effectively a Lovecraftian space Satan, and attacking it will only add to its strength. But why bring the military out for nothing so they fire everything they have at it? Which results in it growing even stronger. Which somehow introduces us to our protagonist, Corbin Dallas, played by Bruce fucking Willis in his prime. Not sure if he's having nightmares about this thing Fantasy Star 2 style, but even so, that hardly compares to the nightmare that is his life. Sure, he used to be a highly decorated military badass, but now he's a bitterly divorced single cat dad who's trying to make ends meet by driving a cab, and he can't even do that without having to deal with a random holdup by criminals brandishing Borderlands SMGs in his face. Good thing for me it's not loaded. <laughs> what do you mean it's not loaded? We well, have, have to push that little yellow button to load it. That is the problem with smart guns in the hands of dumb people. This adds yet another piece of loot to his collection, and then it's off to work! Vito has his work cut out for him, too, giving the president a crash course in elementology. Good thing he's so receptive, because lesson one is that they have 48 hours before the world is destroyed. But don't worry, they've been planning their only line of defense for centuries, and the Mondo Shiwan are bringing the stones and the perfect being over right on schedule. To be ambushed by the Mangalore, who fire away at their spacecraft, DESTROYING IT! <laughs> I suppose every universe has to go sometime. Aknot, played by Clifton Lloyd Bryan, calls up Jean-Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg, played by Gary Oldman, to let him know the job is done, and they have the payload. So bad guys are doing fantastic. Vito is sent home, distraught, and the government tries to recover what they can from the crash site. Only one survivor. And Survivor is putting it really, really loosely here, considering all they got is a gauntlet that still had a chunk of hand left in it. But remember, this is the future. Medical technology is absolutely ridiculous, and they can use the DNA to rebuild them. The DNA that is jam-packed with way, way more code than people are used to. Tightly packed with infinite genetic knowledge, almost like this being was engineered. And whoever engineered them did a terrible job at optimization. But this special effects shot is a bit extreme even for practical effects, reminding us all, oh yeah, this movie did come out in 1997. After the doctors finish 3D printing their patient, they discover it's a butt-ass naked Mila Jovovich! I'd like to take a few pictures. The archives. Ah oh, yes, the, uh, only archives. Flash photography wakes her up right quick, and she begins speaking a strange language. One of those languages made specifically for a movie, but also more than linguistically sound, as Mila could already speak four languages fluently by the time this film was made. However, her character can't speak English just yet, and General Monroe, played by Brian James, tells her she better learn quick if she wants to get out of there. General alert. Or go for the classic punch-through-the-unbreakable material and turn the key method. Much more efficient. Of course, security is covering her only exit, so with that in mind, she leaps through the tinfoil wall! Rushing through the spacious ventilation shafts to escape, she is pursued by the police, all the way to the outside of the building. Not much footing here, but that doesn't mean she has nowhere to run, leaping and falling right in the back seat of a cab. Corbin's cab. The fact that he's the first person to not aggressively go after her is at least a good sign, but when the police surround his vehicle, he's got no reason to not comply. Much as she seems to not want to go with them, he's already in deep with one license credit left and literally can't afford to do anything about this. But that's nothing an incredibly convenient advertisement combined with an inherent knowledge of the Roman alphabet can't fix. Eventually. Her pleas aren't enough to get him to just forget about why all this is a bad idea for him, but once enough tears are involved, he takes off and a chase scene ensues! They tear through the streets, alleyways, and down into the fog to escape pursuit. Which he does manage to do. Kind of beating up the cab, but they slip the cops. Though Corbin is slightly worried that he might have damaged the goods along the way. Please. <laughs> you don't need a priest, you just need a doctor. You'll be alright. I need to. Cornelius. What? Along 
with her understanding of the alphabet and phonetics, she also happens to know enough plot points to keep this movie going. Armed with the name and a phone book, Corbin tracks Vito's apartment down, and he tells him that she is the fifth element. But she's also unconscious, so Corbin can wake her while Vito grabs some things. Asking politely isn't working, so uh, maybe the Sleeping Beauty method will get somewhere. You're right, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. I, it was wrong. Well, might be on the wrong side of the bed, but hey, you got her up! But this is Bruce Willis we're talking about. He's not gonna let a little thing like a gun to his head prevent him from being a proper gentleman. As such, he works on the formalities, introducing himself as Corbin Dallas and giving her a chance to tell him who she is. Good. That, that whole thing's your name, huh? Yeah. My chances of pronouncing that right are up there with me getting a call from the asylum to star in their mockbuster, The Sixth Element. Understanding my plight, Corbin requests she give him a shorter, easier to market moniker. Lilu. Derived from this movie's divine language, meaning precious stones. Also, fun fact, it became a quite popular name in real life after this movie came out, specifically in France. With the introductions taken care of, Vito can thank Corbin for his help and tell him to get the hell out of here. lilu has got about 5,000 years of catching up to do, so going about this as efficiently as possible, she's reading Wikipedia in alphabetical order. So years before Neo, Lilu knew Kung Fu. Vito would rather we cut the chicken appreciation hour short, though, and get down to brass tacks. Where is the case that had the stones? She's like, yeah, it got jacked. But by who? Why, evil Mr. Zorg, of course! Who, when tasked to make the hard choice to fire half a million cab drivers because of the economy, instead fires an entire million of them because evil! It was Zorg who hired the Mangalores to attack the Motoshiwan vessel to steal the elemental stones. Their payment? Why, the badass Swiss army gun, of course, the ZF-1. 3,000 round magazine with that Atlas-style homing system hidden with a named one, and the rest will follow. Not to mention the Torg RPG, the flat-off darts and nets, the Malawan flamethrower, and just for funsies, a cryo-thrower to boot. Four crates of guns for one crate of stones. This... This case is empty. <laughs> But while they checked the tag on the luggage, they never actually um, opened up to make sure that it was in there. Or thought much of the fact that it was suspiciously light. Though I guess that is harder to tell in space. This gives us a lovely split scene where Zorg argues with the Mangalores, and Vita begs for Lilu to explain that the stones were never on the Mandoshiwan ship. They were not 100% confident in humanity, so while Lilu was being sent, the elemental stones are instead at a completely different secret location. It's Planet Floston in the Angel Constellation. <sighs> We're saved. I'm screwed. Meaning Zorg has absolutely no idea where the stones are. That guy really has the deck stacked up against him here. But he promised them guns for the case. They brought the case. They want the guns. Zorg is obviously not pleased with this turn of events in the slightest, but after a little negotiating, strikes a deal. One case for the empty box. And they better hope they can figure out how they work without an instruction manual. A real killer, when he picked up the ZF-1, would have immediately asked about the little red button on the bottom of the gun. Ah, TDR. So, new plan! Gotta find the stones, so he sends some goons to collect the priest. It seems that's how Zorg knew about the stones in the first place. He hit up the elemental priest pretending to be an art dealer. But Vito knows well now that Zorg is a terribly evil man. Destruction itself made flesh, and he has nothing to say, as he stands for the protection of life. Zorg argues that so-called peace is the antithesis of life, as life itself is merely the result of destruction and chaos. Without disorder, life has nothing to do, and may as well be death. Speaking of death, Zorg's drink went down the wrong hole and the cherry with it, and boy is his face red. Vito can't help but remark about the tragic irony that Zorg's got all these little robots and toys for his every desire and whim, but he never thought to get a friend that could pat him on the back. You, you saved my life, and in return I'll spare yours. <clears throat> what is that?
Light side points gained. Oh, never mind. Where'd I put my chainsaw? So Zorg's search continues for the stones. They figure, hey, bug the president's office. That might turn up something. Coincidentally enough, they just so happen to get inside right when General Monroe just so happens to be explaining that the stones just so happen to be in the possession of a famous diva set to do a charity ball at Floston Paradise. How convenient. Excellent. Ah! But that is all the details they managed to get. So they missed the part where the president says they need to send someone for the stones, but in complete secrecy, so nobody knows what's going on. Not even the person going, it seems, as Corbin Dallas is having lunch only to get a mysterious message from out of nowhere. You are fired! Oh, right. <laughs> Million layoffs. What are the odds? The bad news just keeps coming, as this was the only scene with Kim Chan. And then Corbin has to take a call from his mother, played by Jill Mullen, who he clearly has a strained relationship with, but even worse. She's upset he hasn't called her up first to tell them that they're going to Floston Paradise for that contest he won. If I don't want a trip, I'd know about it. Somebody would have notified me. Corbin, they've been blaring your name out on the radio for the last hour, you big ape. Yeah, well, who the hell listens to the radio anymore? If that's not a big enough hint, who should happen to show up but General Monroe? You see, they rigged the contest, as Corbin, the former military badass, is just the kind of undercover super soldier they need to ensure the success of this mission. To save the world! Not a bad deal, either. Most people have to face down death itself for this kind of calling. All Corbin has to do is take a vacation. Major Iceborg will accompany you as your wife. I am not going. But you can't forget the rules of the hero's journey. Refusing to call is part of the deal. And this call definitely needs some refusing. But then, Corbin Dallas's name is torn off his door, and Lilu has arrived! Which means he has to comedically find somewhere to hide these three soldiers. Somewhere in his tiny, one-room apartment. Fortunately, he does just so happen to own a very spacious icebox. What? Major! What? Major! What? The three of us won't fit in there! Sure you will. <laughs> Major! 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 I'm gonna have claustrophobia nightmares after this. But Lilu's little visit was all just a ruse, as Vito heard that Corbin won the contest, and that's just the ticket he needs to get to Flost in Paradise and save the world. But the police arrive to do a sweep, so again Corbin has to figure out where to hide these two. Lilu in the shower and Vito in the bed. Very, very conveniently, Vito did just so happen to remove Corbin's tag from the door just now and stick it on another door, which even more conveniently contained quite the surly individual. The guy's just been arrested for uranium smuggling. Everything's going as planned. All I have to do now is go to the airport, take his place, and I'll be in Floss in less than four hours. <sighs> okay, so, so is everyone's plans figured out here? Okay, good, because we've still got like an hour of movie left to go. So it's time to get things moving. Corbin gets Lilu out of the shower and Vito out of bed. But Vito takes one of his military trophies and bashes him over the head, stealing his tickets to Flostin. Which means by the time he comes to... Take the mission. He's finally over the refusing to call hump and ready to go save the world. And uh, d don't worry about them, they'll, they'll, they'll walk it off. Vito's plan was to have his apprentice, David, played by Charlie Creed Miles, stand in as the winner, Corbin David Dallas, with the help of some handy-dandy fake multi-passes. But as David fumbles his way through it, who would happen to show up but Corbin? Thanking him for keeping his tickets warm, he sends him off and takes his spot next to Lilu. But when David takes his spot next to Vito, the priest realizes things didn't go exactly as planned, so entrusting David with the key, he rushes to find a way to fix this. Right around the same time, the Mangalores are trying to sneak on board with Corbin's identity, and Corbin is being ushered over for his other prize, an interview with the one and only Ruby Rod. Corbin Dallas! Here he is, the one and only winner of the Gemini Crockett Contest! Played by none other than Chris Tucker in his most memorable of roles. Or, or at least one of his loudest. Which is expected, as he's the most popular space radio show host, and Corbin Dallas is his special guest. And he's got something to say to those 50 billion pair of beers out there. Pop it, D-Man. Uh, well, now would be a good time to like the video. And subscribe. Unbelievable! Corbin isn't nearly as high energy as Ruby over here, which is a bit, uh, 
underwhelming as he's got a show to put on here. But Corbin is Bruce Willis and has no problem telling him to keep his microphones to himself. He's not here to be a guest on some galactic radio broadcast. He's here to stick by Lilu's side as they save the world. Lilu tells him that's good, that's great, because after all, he's Bruce Willis, which is... It is impressive, but she is Mila Jovovich, the perfect being, ultra strong and tasked with saving the world, and therefore she can help keep the comparatively squishy Mr. Dallas in one piece during this adventure. Sleep. Sweet dreams, Mr. Dallas. Man, I need to get me one of those. I can never sleep on a flight. And this is no reason for things to slow down. So, while Vito figures out he can stow away by climbing into the landing gear, Zorg's subordinate calls him up with the bad news about not being able to get on the ship, and Zorg BLOWS HIM THE FUCK UP! No worries, they have liftoff and there's no brakes on the Flossed in Paradise train. While the heroes are on their way, the evil Dark Planet makes an evil collect call to the evil Mr. Zorg. Yeah, Dark Falls wants the elemental stones, and Zorg needs to hop to it. But first, the heroes have made it to Flossed in Paradise, but Corrin has already lost sight of Lilu. But don't you worry, he does find somebody he recognizes. So tell me, my man, you were happy uh, in the big world. Thrill, 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 thrill. He signed up for a kick-ass space adventure, and he's spending the whole time getting screamed at by Chris Tucker. Just what you have to deal with when you're saving the world. He knows the plan, though. The diva, played by Maya Wen, is going to sing for the charity ball with her singing voice performed by Inva Mula, and after the show, he can get the stones from her. But when has anything gone according to plan? The Mangalore are here, and they raid the diva's room in search of the stones, but not so fast, for Lilu is keeping watch and moves in to kick all the asses and take all the names. While the diva's singing bounces between notes uh, not humanly possible. No surprise, as she is an alien, and a human that was tasked with singing that got a little help in post with them editing and stringing these impossible notes together. By the end of it all, Lilu secures the crate the Mangalores are trying to steal, but not so fast, for Zorg has arrived to take care of this personally. So she hands over the box, but he doesn't intend to let her live, firing wildly at the vents she escaped into. Right around the same time, the Mangalores hijack the cruise ship, and another group heads into the ballroom and shoots the diva. So things have just gone tits up real fast. Eh, Zorg figures may as well set a time bomb while we're at it, just to keep things interesting. So, things are looking bad, but don't worry, the diva knows that the fifth element needs these stones, and entrusts Corbin with the knowledge of where to find them. They're not here! The stones, where are they? In me. The stones are... inside the diva. Which makes me wonder how the hell they pulled that off. There are so many ways to go about it. And yeah, that ain't a metaphor. Corbin uses that handy-dandy gaping wound to reach inside and fish out the stones. Even better, he's finally found a use for Ruby Rod over here. You guard this with your life or you're gonna look like this guy right here. Green? Green. Super green? Super green. Is that your idea of a discreet operation? D -d Don't worry, sir. See, General Monroe is fine. He didn't even get freeze bun. Of course, broadcasting the location of the Elemental Stones to an audience of 50 billion does mean that Corbin is absolutely not getting a stealth bonus when all this is done. No bother, that just means we can go full-on action movie! Bodies pile up left and right! And Corbin secures the precious stones the only way an action movie badass could. By running away from a huge explosion! That's all well and good, but the Mangalores have the priest, which calls for a ceasefire, while Corbin heads inside alone to negotiate. Anybody else want to negotiate? Ah, it's so nice. I've spent so long on Twitter, I forgot what a civilized debate looks like. But all this excitement, there's something we forgot about. <laughs> Lilu, she's still up in the vents. Caught a few stray bullets. Not enough to kill her, but she ain't doing so hot. But, 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 we can't have only one crisis at a time. What kind of movie do you think this is? So they discover the time bomb Zorg planted on the door. So everyone must run. The lifeboats are filled while Zorg returns for the stones. That means that Corbin can steal Zorg's ship and escape, and Zorg is... Strangely, calm about that, less than a minute to live. Remember though, he set the bomb and he can deactivate it just as easily with but five seconds remaining. So he's fine. 
But the Mangalore are really heavy into that honor stuff and, having failed their mission, set off their own bomb right next to Zorg. Oh no. Which takes care of the human bad guy. Well, you know, mostly human anyway. But there's still the issue of the dark, evil something in space, and it's headed towards Earth right now! So, two hours to get the job done. Better get off to that temple fast, but not so fast that Lilu has to stop reading up on things. Now reaching the letter W, and all the history of human war. So, uh, <laughs> kinda knocks the wind out of her sails for believing in the virtue of saving the world. So, with but minutes left, they set up the stones and discover they must unlock them by providing them with the elements that they represent. However, the fifth element is unresponsive, unable to create the light of life. Unable to believe that humanity has anything left worth saving. But Corbin refuses to hear that. There is something worth saving. Love! Ah, the fifth element was heart. Now I get it. And the cleansing light erupts from her mouth, destroying the dark planet, but miles from the Earth's surface. And it's awful lucky she didn't catch Corbin in the face with that on the wing, as, uh, that would have been awkward. Therefore, happy ending! The Earth is saved, and we won't have to worry about that problem again for another 5,000 years. And more importantly, Corbin and Lilu are together at last. Yes! What's wrong with you? What's your screaming for? Every five minutes there's something above. And for better or worse, it looks like we're going to have to wait another 5,000 years for another one like this. Anyway, that was the fifth element. Man, they just don't make them like they used to. Yeah, I know, the movies I tend to watch aren't even close to the best stuff we get out of modern cinema. But that doesn't mean that I don't watch new or big budget movies at all. But I can't tell you the last one I did that even held a candle to the pit element. From start to finish, the movie transports you into another world, bombarding you with lore and events that almost overwhelm, stuffing the two-hour runtime with so much stuff that not a single frame is wasted, and the movie doesn't feel nearly as long as it is. Not to mention the absolutely star-studded cast. Big names giving fantastic performances left, right, and center. Bruce Willis makes a great stoic hero who grows and loves as the events transpire. And despite this, Mila Jovovich steals the show as Lilu, learning about this world along with the audience and being clearly not of it. And I could get into some sort of negative ish aspects, but uh, well, let's be honest, this all just comes off as incredibly nitpicky. Uh, yeah, the Dark Planet made a phone call, but it, it also ate up a bunch of communication satellites beforehand. But communication was seemingly never affected when it did. Uh, Future McDonald's still looks fun and colorful as opposed to the depressed brown motif they've actually grown into. Uh, sometimes tires squeal with flying cars. All things we could agree didn't make the most sense when you think about them, but honestly, blink and you'll miss it. They don't even come close to bringing down the overall quality of the feature. At the end of the day, the fifth element remains an absolute roller coaster ride in action sci fi, and thanks to the smart use of practical effects with CGI flourishes, and it having been made on actual film, still looks phenomenal today, almost 30 years later. If you want someone to complain about it, uh, you're gonna have to find someone else, as it handily comes in at five elements out of five. <sighs> It really feels good to watch a legit fantastic movie every now and again. Helps detox you from all that schlock. Uh, thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow. And remember, Bruce Willis is an amazing actor. And he was also pretty well known even before this movie came out. Mila Jovovich, however, this movie arguably made her career, skyrocketing her up into superstardom. And she has been front and center the star of a lot of big movies after this. In a lot of genres that... I like watching. So, now's as good a time as any to declare this. The of I mean, I know she's made to be strong. She's also so fragile, so human. You know what I mean? Ah, 90s sci-fi movies based on stories that were created well before the movies were made. What does that remind me of? Ah, yeah, Starship Troopers. I reviewed that one right there. You can check that out. Or the algorithmic selected recommended video thing. Computers have taken all our jobs. See if it takes that one, too.